Amen. Welcome. Nice to see you this morning. Nice to see your faces. Who was here last week? Hands up. Some of you, all of you online were here last week, right? Watching online in your living room. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, we've got in here and we've got people still watching online, but hopefully we get some good news this week, right? I'm trusting. Don't be quiet this morning. You are the life of the party. If you are quiet, the people online will think that we're just fooling everyone and there's no one actually here. So you need to make some noise. Beautiful to dedicate uh, children to the Lord this morning. And uh, the youth hall, uh, f- we are actually got some technology going and they've just joined us. So welcome to everyone in the youth hall this morning. Nice to have you in church. We've got a bit more church than just you here. But we're trusting maybe that uh, we will have, be able to have a few more extra bums on chairs from next week. Please, Cyril Ramaphosa, please. Amen. All right, turn with me in your Bibles to um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Ephesians 4, verse 1. We're going to read there in a moment. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to buy a Bible, to get a good Bible. NIV or CSB or ESV, these are different uh, versions of translation. Um, Some of them read a bit easier than others. Um, but get a good Bible. Amen. Well, what we've been doing uh, since last week, actually in the beginning of the year, we started a series called What We Value. And uh, we want to go through the 12 values of Solid Ground Church uh, throughout the, this year. So we did four in the beginning of the year, and then it was locked down, and we had to preach something else because everyone was in turmoil, right? So we kept, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, we decided we're going to do four in the beginning of the year, and then we're going to do four now, and then uh, we're going to finish the year off uh, with four, our last four. So I'm excited about that. We believe that God has a vision for His church. God has a vision for His church. He's taking us somewhere. He's got an ideal for us. It is the vision of Jesus to become like Jesus. Okay, imagine many of us coming like Jesus together, becoming like Jesus together. The impact that we will have to grow in confidence in Jesus Christ, to grow in the work that Jesus has called each of us to do. God has a vision for his church. You know that God has his vision for each local church. He's put us in Middleburg for a reason. You and I have a mission field before us. There are people to be reached. There are certain ways of Middleburg which require God-given strategy to reach people where they are at, to draw people in as God drew us in with cords of loving kindness. So he's charging his church to also draw others in to the love of Christ. And so we have a vision You can actually read it in our foyer wall on your way out. And we have a mission, which is the Great Commission. Go out into all the world and make disciples of people from every nation. But in order to be that, we can't just live how we want and expect that miraculously we're going to pop out and become the, 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 the kind of church that God is calling us to be. It's not going to happen by apathy or just by sitting on the couch, putting our feet up and saying, God, you know, it's like those, all those, you know, going to... To, to bed with the book under the, your, your pillow, hoping that the science is going to just transfer from under your book to your brain. You know that one meme of the child just waving the, the answer, you know, waving the textbook over his head, hoping that it's going to, it's not going to happen like that. We need to prioritize some things. We, ne- we actually need to change the way we behave. We have to change what's important to us so that it lines up with scripture ultimately. And so we looked in Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, and Acts 4, 29 to 35, and we read accounts of the early church, and we say, God, what did they prioritize? Let our priorities be the same. And that's where we've drawn our values. And so this past Sunday, we, we started a, just a two-part series on the value of unity. Unity, oneness, wholeness, harmony in God's church. Working together, not working against one another. Speaking for one another, not speaking against one another. The value of unity. This is an area where the church has needed healing again. So much brokenness, division, splitting, selfish agendas that have taken hold in churches. And we want to be a church that is unified in Jesus' name. So we spoke about last Sunday, what is Christian unity? Well, it is oneness. 
when Jesus prays for unity in his church in John chapter 17, he says, the kind of oneness that I share with you, Father, is the kind of oneness that I want my people to share with one another. So the standard of unity is how Jesus and the Father relate. That's a high standard. So let's not drop our standard just because we fall short. Let's keep that as our aim. Secondly, we talked about what is the foundation for Christian unity? Well, it's receiving God's Son, Jesus Christ. We unify around the person and work of Jesus Christ. No other name. So it's not like, hey, you believe whatever you want to believe and you do whatever you want to do. No, we unify it because we're following Jesus. We unify it because we obey His Word and we unify it because we want to grow in His love. And so today, I want to just talk about three things to close off this value of unity, and hopefully it's laid a good foundation for us to build on, is number one, how do we keep unity in the church? Because we've got to maintain it. There's a unity that's been purchased for us on the, on the cross of Jesus, but how do we keep walking in it? Make sure that it doesn't get damaged and broken. Make sure that it actually we, 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 we preserve it and attain the full unity that Christ died for. Number two, I want to talk about what is the purpose of unity in the church? Why does God want us to be one and whole and living in harmony with one another? Thirdly, and lastly, I want to talk about what is the overflow? What's the overflow? What's the byproduct of unity in the church? In 2003, there was a, um, a Springbok team coached by a guy called Rudolf Strauli. And, uh, and he did something that was, um, I, I get his heart, but the, the media was bound to get all over it. You can, some of you will remember what I'm talking about if you're a rugby fan this morning. It was called Kamp Staldraat, Camp Steel Wire, okay, for the English speakers. Okay, and on this camp was supposed to be a unifying team bonding experience, right? And uh, they made them, the team box each other and do funny things together, and uh, the media got hold of it, and it became a nightmare uh, for the, um, whatever, the media uh, controllers of the team, whatever you call them. All right, come start right. Anyway, it was around uh, that time that we were leading a youth ministry shortly after that, and we thought, hang on, you know, as a bit of a joke, let's call our youth boys camp, come start right. So we had come start right at a church that we were the youth leaders um, at. And uh, it was an interesting time. It was such a good camp, actually. So many young uh, men were impacted on that camp. But we did it at Wartvorbofen. And uh, it's funny, um, in the beginning of the camp, we, uh, were, dri we were driving to Wartvorbofen. And, uh, and none of the boys knew what was coming. And basically, if you put a bunch of teenage boys who love to gym and flex their muscles and show off, and then there's a one or two quiet artistic types in there that kind of just keep to themselves. What happens in that bus is that you just get a whole lot of ego <laughs> and not a whole lot of unity, actually. Yeah. So 15 kilometers before come Staldrat, stop the vehicle. I mean, before we get to fight for birth and stop the vehicle. Everybody out. So now it's game time, now it's serious face. What's going on? Open your bags. Where's all those nice little snacks that mommy packed you? Take them out. All of a sudden, everyone's trying to hide their jelly beans and stuff, you know. We got all their snacks out. Went to the leaders. Life is not always fair, lesson number one. <laughs> Guys, the car's not going any further. You're going to walk the rest of the way. Yo, have I ever heard such macho men start moaning and complaining, my bag, I forgot, I didn't bring a backpack, I bought my mom's triple story carry-on <laughs> luggage. So 15 kilometers on dirt farm road, we begin walking. Can I tell you this? That through suffering, the guys were humbled, and on day two, we had a unified group of young boys who would fight for one another. And the lesson, if I can say what's the big idea of today, is that unity is maintained through humility. Unity is maintained through humility. Pride, egos, arrogance, self-centeredness always results in nastiness that causes unrighteous splits and divisions. Let's read Ephesians 4 verse 1 to 6. 
Therefore, this is Paul writing, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Oneness. Point number one, how do we keep unity in the church? Verse two tells us how we maintain spiritual unity. How do we do it? With all humility and gentleness and with patience, bearing with one another in love. We make every effort to keep the unity. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. That should be a picture of the church and how the church operates together. You know, humility, it's to be humbled by the mercy of God. To be humbled by the mercy of God. Pride is always the enemy of unity. And pride manifests itself in various ways. Maybe you can identify, here's a couple of ways that pride manifests. Number one, pride manifests in half-heartedness when it comes to the kingdom of God. Fence-sitting or lukewarmness. So this is the person who says, I've got something better going on. Going all into the church, well, that's a little bit below me. I've actually got more important business to attend to. That's the one way that pride can manifest. Secondly, pride manifests in self-righteousness. That's the person who says, I'm better than you lot. I'm better than the Christian community. I'm more righteous than them. I don't need a small group. I don't need the annoyance that comes with dealing with other imperfect and immature people. That's, ugh, I can't stand that. Why would I put myself in amongst a bunch of people that are, uh, are, are weak and, and, and stumbling along trying to serve Jesus? I'm much better than that. Pride um, manifests itself in gossip or slander. That is what James calls a loose tongue. That's the person who says, I make myself feel, be- feel better by exposing or talking about someone else's shame. And so we cut people and ministries down. We're too proud to actually just celebrate what God is doing in people around us and speak well of them. Instead, we always want to focus on the negative that's going on in someone's life and expose it. We dishonor the church and the church leadership so easily with our tongue. We think nothing of it. Pride can manifest itself in selfish ambition. That is the person who says, I've actually got my own agenda. Pride can manifest itself in anger and rage and bitterness, and these all actually stem from unforgiveness. That's the person that says, I'm unwilling to let go of my hatred and anger. People don't deserve my kindness. Don't try to change me. You know, we often talk in leadership gatherings at Solid Ground Church about the kind of people we need to be, and we say, don't be a prickly pear. Man, I hate that fruit. It shouldn't be called a fruit. I don't know, it should just be like, not even a fruit or a vegetable. It should just be like its own thing. I wouldn't recommend eating something that looks like a cactus, for one. It's, like, it's telling you, stay away from me. I, I, don't want, I don't want you. But maybe that's there for the animals. That, you know. Anyway, okay. But someone discovered how to pick a uh, prickly pear. But um, if you've ever held a prickly pear, it's not very fun. Don't be a prickly pear. You're someone who can't be taught. Someone who's always got their back up. Someone's always doubting everyone's intentions around them. Someone who's, who's internally bitter and just ang- angry all the time, and the minute you just like step on their toes or do something they don't like, you get like a whole backlash. And it's like, whoa, don't touch me. And we are proud if we don't want to lay that stuff down and say, actually, man, like, let my ego just fall to the floor. I want to be teachable. I want to grow. Even if someone tells me something I already know, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to belittle them and say, yeah, I already knew that, by the way. Man, can you handle letting go of your ego? It's what's required for unity in the church. Pride manifests itself in self centeredness. It's all about me. Never mind others. What is the church going to do for me? And another and last way that pride can manifest itself, I'm sure there's more. These are just some I came up with is self-reliance. 
or independence. I don't need anyone's help. I, I, I don't need brothers and sisters around me. I, I don't need community. Um, I do church on my own terms. Friends, we must let God deal with our pride however it manifests. We must. If we want unity, we must let God deal with our pride. Why don't we pray right now? Lord Jesus, I'm sure that as we read through the examples, I can even see myself in some of them. And I just want to ask Jesus Christ. We just want to lay ourselves down afresh this morning and say, deal with our pride. Deal with our self-centeredness, our self-reliance. Deal with any anger, bitterness, or rage, any gossip or slander. Oh God, where small towns are known of gossip, we pray that of the church in Middleburg, they would say, those people speak well of one another. Those people have good things to say about God and what he's on about in people's lives. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Christian humility is to think lowly of ourselves and highly of Christ. Oh God, if it were not for you, I would be completely and utterly lost. God, the good things that you've given me, I don't deserve them, Lord. Oh God, I'm just gonna enjoy your leading. I'm gonna enjoy what you give me, God. Everything from your hand is good. Even the trials that you lead me through, God, I'm gonna be faithful and serve you through them. We regard Christ as high and we regard ourselves as low. And you know what happens? God will then lift you up by his own hand and he will bring you high. But when you try to bring your own self high, friends, it starts to look ugly and it causes division. And it's not a nice thing. Not in church, not in business, not in family. But you go low. Rory Dyer always says, what is humility? Aim low. And God, he, he's gonna be the one that will lift you high. Amen. The world cannot attain unity because of human pride. Where there is human pride, there is selfish agenda. And at the cross, we lay down our selfish agenda to take up God's agenda. Philippians 2 verse 4 to 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. I've learned this thing when it comes to following Jesus, that when you look to the interests of others, God takes care of your interests. When you build God's house, he builds your house. I don't know how it works. I can't explain it, but I've seen it in my own family. I've seen it in my mom and dad. I've seen them sacrifice. For those that don't know, they planted this church 35 years ago. I've seen radical provision in their lives that was unexpected when they chose to put their own agendas aside and take up God's agenda, serve the interests of others, and God has blessed them. Romans 12 verse 3 says, By the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Friends, we should be humbled by Christ. We should be astounded that we have been forgiven and set free and given an inheritance that is eternal. We are going to share in the glory of God. Lift your eyes to heaven this morning. Be humbled again. Don't worry about what people think of you. Don't worry if you misunderstood. God knows you. God's opinion about you matters. The second thing Paul says when it comes to maintaining unity is be patient. Why? Because God is patient with you. He's very patient with you. Some of you don't realize how patient God is with you. You think God can't wait to give you that big hiding. Meanwhile, God is just saying, my son, my patience for you is abounding. It's just, it's overflowing. It would change your life if you knew my patience over your life. Some of us grew up with an impatient father. We just put one step out of line and I've got to remind myself of this as a parent. I can't be so harsh on my child. Every time they get it wrong, just be right there to say, stop it. You know, God is not like that. It's a patient dad. You know that proud people are not patient. The more highly you think of yourself, the more quickly you think you should be served. 
When you sit at a restaurant with a proud person at the table, then you know that this waiter, poor waiter is in for a treat this morning. <laughs> you know, when we're humbled by the mercy of Jesus, it doesn't feel inappropriate if you're not treated like a dignitary. Just like, well, you know, I don't have any expectations of how it ought to be treated. I've got great examples in our church of people that have been so successful in business and yet are so humble. So that, that is not what defines them. What defines them is that they have been forgiven at the cross of Christ and they serve Jesus. Part of that patience Paul talks about is bearing with one another in love. John Piper says, I'm so glad that Paul said that we must endure one another. This frees me from the hypocritical need to think that I or anyone else in the church am perfect. You see, perfect people don't need to be endured or forgiven, but we do, and often. So God knows that solid ground is filled with imperfect people, sometimes grumpy, sometimes critical, sometimes unreliable, sometimes difficult. And he knows the pastor is far from perfect, a man desperately in need of the grace of God. And he knows that we all have differences, some of them large, some of them small. So Paul's counsel here in Ephesians is not how perfect people can live together in unity, but how real, imperfect, solid grounders can maintain the unity of the Spirit by enduring with one another, bearing up with one another in love. What is the purpose of unity in the church? Why is unity important? Well, two things. Unity makes Jesus known. Unity brings God's glory, glory to God. John 17, 23 says, I am in them and you are in me, so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them as you loved me. When the church is living in harmony, humble together, loving one another, upholding the truth of God's word together, people look at the church and say, surely God is amongst them. Maybe, this, I, maybe this, this thing that's written in the word about a man called Jesus who rose to life and was sent by God to forgive the sins of the world, maybe there's truth in that. Maybe it's real because these people are changed. These people are loving. These people are kind. These people are different. Romans 15 verse 5 to 6 says, Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. When we are not in unity, we bring dishonor to God's name. When there's splits and divisions and gossip and slander in the church, it does not exalt Christ. But when there is unity and harmony and oneness in the Spirit, God is glorified. What's the overflow of unity in the church? Psalm 133, verse one to three. What's, in other words, what's the, by, what's the byproduct of unity? It says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard. Aaron was the high priest. And the anointing oil was the Holy Spirit coming upon him in power. And it says, when God's people live in unity, it's like Aaron drenched with the oil of the Spirit of God, running down on the collar of his robe. It is, a, it is a, as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. In other words, what the psalmist is saying is unity in the church is good and it's pleasant and it's in that place where God commands his blessing. I don't know about you, but I want to live with God's people under the blessing of God. I invite you in this morning. Jesus is inviting all of us in this morning. Will you lay down your pride and say, I'm going to commit to Christ's church, and I'm going to lay down my ego, and I'm going to build the unity of this church. In Acts 5, verses 12 to 15, it says, Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them. Interesting statement. But the people spoke well of them. Then the next verse almost seems contrary to what's just been said because it says, Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitudes, both men 
and women. So no one dared join them, but the church is growing. What's going on here? Well, I think this. Because being part of the church came with real consequences, as in persecution or estrangement from your culture or community, because following Jesus was, dis was divisive in that sense. I mean, you were, you were, you were, you were saying no to, to, to something uh, else, like serving the Roman emperor or staying as a Jew under the old uh, covenant, the law. And, and, and so to, to follow Jesus was actually, a, 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 you know, was a contentious decision. So no one just willy-nilly dared join the church because it came with a consequence. It's like, you, you know, you don't join chess club unless you're serious about playing chess. You don't join the church unless you're serious about following Jesus. And secondly, I believe no one else dared join them because of the unity and single-mindedness of the church. People saw, hey man, I mean, I can't, I can't sign up to play for Real Madrid unless I'm going to practice and give my all for the soccer team. No one dared join them. Unless I'm all in for Jesus, I'm not going to be all in for his church. But then verse 14, but believers were added to their number in multitudes. The church was unified. Here in our day and age, you know, we've got almost church as an event. You know, I kind of, I come and sip at the well every now and again. And I'm saying, Christ called to you, friend, with all grace, mercy. I'm not against you if that has been your a view of church in, in the past. I welcome you in here. But I'm saying, friend, can I encourage you to move to a deeper place and say, actually, um, church is not event anymore. In my eyes, church is going to be the, become the people of God who I worship with, who I mission with, who I fellowship with. I am part of the body of Christ and I'm going to begin to act like it. So two questions I want to ask you this morning in closing. Have you humbled yourself to the head of the church, Jesus? Or is your ego still bigger than it ought to be? And have you joined yourself to Christ's body? Are you all in with the fellowship and the mission and the worship of the saints? You know, Christ is calling you in. He doesn't want you to be lukewarm doesn't want you to sit on the edge. He wants you to be full ball, part of the plan, His plan, for your life in the midst of His body that He's building. And so I invite you this morning, let's close our eyes and pray. In the youth hall, right here in the auditorium, online, where you're watching. Dear Lord Jesus, we don't want to play games with you, God. You've saved us to a high calling and we want to live a life worthy of that high calling. It is by your grace. We haven't worked for it, God. We didn't deserve it, Jesus. We don't have to worry about losing it because it is once and forever that you've called us into your kingdom by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, let us serve you with passion. Let us be unified as one body, worshiping, fellowshipping, missioning together under the name above every other name, Jesus Christ. I pray over every person here this morning, if there's anyone that does not know you, I pray that they would receive of your mercy this morning, that they would know, Father, that whatever guilt and shame they walked into church with, or they're sitting in their living room with, or their car, wherever they're watching, that there is no sin that is too great for, for your forgiveness, God. No matter what they've done, they can be washed clean this morning if they would only just ask, Jesus, wash me clean by your blood. I want the eternal life that you've promised. God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Unify us as a church. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and go out with a song of praise, and, uh, and then we're going to go out and head out, and we've got another surface, service happening. God bless you. Um, it's great to be together. Let's sing. Amen. Cause you stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me
church, if there's anyone that would like prayer for anything, please feel free to come to the front. We've got a ministry team here ready to pray for you. And there's coffee out the back. Thanks for joining us this morning. Have an incredible week ahead. God bless you.